Great. I'm just sharing my screen. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, I actually just got a little bit emotional seeing all these old familiar faces. Um, yeah, it made me a little bit sad because this year we were planning to have another Community Energy Congress and I know a lot of you have been to and it's always so nice to have them and to get time together to learn and, and to discuss things. So yeah, it just made me a bit like, oh, there's all these people that I know. Um, and I also just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of the researchers that are, have started this committee to really support our sector. Um, you know, the Board of the Coalition for Community Energy is just really excited to have you guys along and supporting us and being so active. So just a huge thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, my very, I guess my, my very sort of um, uh, localised perspective of why community energy is critical to a rapid renewable energy transition. Um, so firstly, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of the historical and current role of, of you know, how I see my community's actions in, in regards to pushing the bar from a community and project level perspective. Then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the role of community energy across the whole spectrum. So through to large scale developments, the sweet spot of relevance for community energy and also some of the policy keys for the sector. So going back to 2010, uh, the anti-wind farm movement was absolutely in its prime. And I was lucky enough to be employed um, as one of the first staff members for Hepburn Wind. And we were the first project in the country to have a dedicated role for community energy, uh, for community engagement and, and for community energy as well. Um, if you fast forward 10 years, uh, it's absolutely business as usual for all renewable energy developers to have roles like that that, that, that we created very, very early on. Um, and some of the other things that we did that were really pushing the bar very early on were having an open and accessible site. Um, so really looking at our wind farm as a community asset and welcoming the community into it and deploying a benefit sharing model that the, the renewal, the commercial sector is still now trying to deploy, you know, a whole bunch of these, these outcomes. And some of them have been done successfully. Some of them are still not, not being deployed. So we, we did this back in 2010. We did a community fund with a priority for the, for the immediate neighbourhood. We did a gift of equity for all neighbours. We do a neighbourhood power contribution for discounts on bills and we do donation solar for community facilities. Um, fast forward to, to, to 2020 uh, and, you know, I, I hope that we are uh, lifting the bar again with, with our new plans. So our new plans are for, to add a 7.44 megawatt a solar farm on site and a 10 megawatt hour battery. So we, we will likely be the first hybrid facility in Victoria of that type. Um, and we've, we've done a sensitive design to our solar farm. So it's really based distinctly around Leonard's Hill, where, where our wind farm is and what our farmer, Ron Rivasich, wanted to see on site. So, you know, he didn't want topsoil removal. He wanted the least arable area of the farm used. So you know, characteristics like that have meant that we've gone through a very condensed technology with a small footprint with a north, south and east, west um, facing array that will kind of fit snugly to the topography that we want it to without us having to kind of carve up, carve up this very good quality farmland. Um, we also have a, trans, you know, a transformative collaborative project with our council and community members called Hepburn Zednet, which is our transition to zero net emissions. And we've done, you know, other things which are, are now getting replicated, um, particularly in, in, in res zones around collaborative funding models. So us teaming up with all the local funders to do uh, collaborative funding under what's called the ZNet Climate Resilience Fund. From a community level, um, I think our work on our zero net emissions program um, is, you know, really what's needed on a community by community basis and it's helping us to start to understand and build literacy beyond energy. So, you know, particularly in regional areas, the agricultural um, component is, is a necessary focus area, as is transport. Um, so this is helping us on a very local level start to really build that awareness. If you, if you ask most people in, in the Hepburn Shire, do they believe in 100% renewables? People go, yes, we can point to the turbines over there. Um, so now we want to see that possible with um, a zero net emissions mandate. 
Um, we, we launched our, our master plan last year and we won the Premier Sustainability Award for, for our work, which, you know, everything we do is open source. And from that original seed funding of 88,000, we've now seen um, almost 3.2 million in direct money being spent um, on climate change action in our Shire. These are some of our community programs um, that we're, we're rolling out. Uh, this isn't all of them, this is some of them. So, you know, solar and battery bulk buys, which are, you know, so many communities are doing these and these are just win-wins for communities. We're doing an electric vehicle bulk buy. We do free energy audits and retrofit support and we're deploying EV charging infrastructure around the Shire. Um, so what I hope will be the, the space that the community energy sector also, um, you know, dwells and expands into is really, you know, uh, we, we've seen really good action with, with setting climate emergency mandates, but also setting, you know, community-wide zero net emission mandates because we have, you know, gaps all over the place um, in regards to what the uh, interim emission targets are for, for state governments. We've got no action and no target setting from the federal government. So we really need these, you know, bottom up targets to be set on, on a local government level. In regards to, to large scale, um, so community energy has distinct relevance, uh, but, but different models are, are more useful. So, you know, the, the commercial public community co-investment model um, has, has relevance. I believe that all commercial developers should put it on the table for their communities. It might not be fit for purpose um, in, in some communities or of interest to some communities, but it should be an option in regards to making sure that as much as possible, some of that local, that, you know, the, the, the profits are, are held locally. So the Sapphire Wind Farm is an example of that. Um, NEON will also be, be doing a community co-investment for oh, the Water Hour Battery in Canberra. Uh, and lots of other commercial projects are also looking at these models. And these, these are, you know, pathways for community energy groups to make sure if there's, there's projects happening in their area, commercial scale projects, these are pathways for them to have deeper engagement and deeper benefit. I don't know if you can see that um, tractor uh, mark in, in the paddock there, but um, that's very close to, to where I live and it, and it says piss off Bosnet with a big transmission tower um, cut out. And that is a 50 acre parcel of land. That is a very large parcel of land. And essentially what we're seeing now, because the first um, transmission line that's, that, that will be built under the AMO ISP is, has gone out for engagement and it will be built through um, my area, is massive opposition, um, which was completely forecast by the local governments that are impacted, um, because it is, you know, an issue of, of top-down planning when there is technical and economic modelling done, but no kind of social effect and social impact assessments done um, very early on. So, you know, my concern is that actually there are going to be these very impactful delays to large scale renewables um, being built out, which, you know, will be a, a really big detriment to the sector. And I think we will see a significant amount of opposition to large scale transmission lines. Um, this has certainly happened in countries like Germany. It's happened in Denmark. In Germany, they have not been built. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, it is a really large risk. I also think that the development of the, the new renewable energy zones where they haven't been done gradually, but when they're done sort of all at once, are also going to have really big social license issues, um, which is concerning you know, for all of us. I think we, we want the big stuff to happen. We also need the, the mid-scale and the small stuff to happen as well. Um, given that though, you know, there is a lot of existing grid infrastructure. There is all the low voltage lines. There is all the distribution network. It needs to be utilised, um, especially once we start thinking about the level of electricity we're going to need for the transport sector to fuel switch. We're going to need more than the current targets of, say, 50% renewable by 2030. By the time you get there, we're going to need a whole lot more to cover transport. So we really need to see this utilisation of the existing grid infrastructure. 
and also, you know, the ability to couple with battery storage for grid and, and bushfire resilience. Um, I think that's going to be very, very key, you know, whether uh, communities are going offline because of, of nearby bushfires or they're directly impacted by bushfires during the fire season, the, the grid reliability is, is a huge issue. So there's, there's a very complementary thing that can happen uh, with mid-scale generation. So the, the one to 10 megawatt scale being built on these on these smaller lines and, and providing a whole bunch of benefits, um, particularly through the bushfire season. Now to do this, it needs policy incentives um, in order to, to become real. Uh, so some of the, the state by state policy objectives um, that we've been lobbying for have been around support for, for zero carbon communities. So this is to develop master plans and then have on, on the ground resourcing to implement their, their projects. Um, having state level mandates for local governments to work with their communities to deliver these so that it is a partnership and because there's so much complementarity that can happen when there's a, a positive partnership between community and local governments. And to establish a community energy target and a community energy incentive to stimulate the mid-scale community energy sector. Um, some of our, our very kind of, you know, a little bit more granular level of detail around a community energy target and a community energy incentive for, the, for Victoria are that, you know, and these could be replicated in other states, is that we would like to see a carve out of the VRET for community energy, so a community energy target. We want to see a robust criteria for, for project proponents to ensure genuine community energy projects are enabled. This would detail an expression of interest process um, so that communities could, could have the time and the space to, to go through um, a process and know there was a level of security there. And then we would need a financial incentive such as a feed-in tariff or an annual payment or a floor price. Um, importantly, community energy projects, they, they need flexibility for how they trade electricity um, because often they want to uh, have local supply arrangements happening and often it's part of their mandate and their membership mandate. Um, I might wrap it up there, but I just wanted to do a little plug um, for the Coalition for Community Energy Knowledge Hub, um, which is a, essentially a clearinghouse and also a hub for um, lots of his, you know, historical documents, feasibility studies, how-to guides, and yeah, if you guys out there have things you would like on there, uh, yeah, just wanted to give it a little plug. Um, Heather and Donna from C4C have been working very, very hard on this, and it's really great to see it live. Thanks. Thanks so much, Taryn. That was wonderful. Jan, are you able to share your screen now? Yeah. Does that look okay on your end? Great. Okay. Um, so before I begin, um, I'd just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, the traditional custodians of the land I'm speaking from today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, I'd also like to preface this discussion by saying that any struggle to remake our energy system must also, be, must also be a struggle to dismantle the structures implicated in the dispossession and oppression of Australia's First Peoples. So I'd like to start by um, reframing the original question as, is a rapid transition to renewable energy without a community energy component possible? For my purposes here, community energy refers to a project where a community group develops, owns, or benefits from a renewable energy resource or energy efficiency initiative. Uh, this definition draws on understandings from the Victorian government's inquiry into community energy, the national community energy strategy, and the recent local power plan instigated by Helen Haynes MP. While this definition represents my best approximation of community energy in Australian political discourse, I do not claim that this is the only way to define community energy, nor that it is the most accurate or complete definition. 
I also accept that community itself is a nebulous term and that there is a need to reject the naturalistic fallacy that community is synonymous with the good, the fair, or the effective. So while community is typically associated with common ways of life, concentrated ties and frequent interaction, small numbers of people, distance from centers of power, familiarity, continuity, and emotional bonds, these connotations do not always map neatly onto community energy groups and projects. With this definition in mind, our question becomes, is a rapid transition to renewable energy in which communities do not develop, own, or benefit from these resources possible? Existing evidence suggests that, at the very least, it is possible to organize a fossil fuel-based energy system in such a way. State agencies and central power authorities oversaw the development of much of Australia's fossil fuel infrastructure in the post-war years, and though these projects spurred local employment, the communities in which they took place had little influence over the direction of their development. In the 1990s, the, coalition, the, sorry, the Council of Australian Governments decided that the vertically integrated industry in each state should be disaggregated and that in place of state-owned utilities with natural monopolies, a competitive market between generators should be established. Privatization offered little in terms of community outcomes and the promise that competition would deliver better services has faltered as investment and innovation continues to stagnate. Compared to fossil fuels, however, renewables offer many perceived advantages, including the relative availability of distributed renewable resources, the access to and modularity of their enabling technologies, and the potential for new forms of ownership. All these features seem to indicate that a rapid transition to renewable energy in which communities develop, own, or benefit from these resources is in fact possible. But this neither guarantees that such a transition will occur nor does it imply that a transition without these elements is untenable or even unlikely. It is certainly possible to have a 100% renewable energy system in which the hidden infrastructures, privatized decisions, and distant consequences of our current system remain in place. AMO's integrated system plan, which provides a roadmap for the development of Australia's national electricity market, does little to check these impulses or provide a framework conducive to community energy. On the rare occasion that communities do warrant a mention in the plan, they figure as passive actors, an obstacle to be circumvented or a problem to be managed to ensure that a project is not unduly delayed. Though the various scenarios in the integrated system plan trace different speeds of transition, they all work from the assumption that the market is the basic organizing mechanism through which to elicit changes in the energy system. This poses a problem for community energy because its unique value is neither in providing energy at the lowest cost, nor in creating the largest returns for investors. As I will argue in a moment, community energy's value is precisely in subverting this market relation. Given that renewables are effectively the cheapest form of energy production today, the transition is no longer a matter of making the case for the economic viability of these technologies. Major energy retailers are well aware that they can capitalize on this transition and are therefore reluctant to cede control over this space given the significant opportunities associated with renewable energy. The International Energy Agency provided an indication of the growing scale of this market yesterday when they released their world energy outlook and declared solar as the cheapest electricity in history. In modeling possible energy pathways out to 2040, the IEA's main scenario included 43% more solar output than their 2018 estimate due to a considerably faster than expected fall in costs. Even when factoring in the cost of backing up variable renewables with battery or pumped hydro storage, solar and wind still provide the lowest levelized cost of electricity across all generation options in Australia. The case for renewables is such that despite Australia being the worst performing country on climate policy and effectively lacking a national emissions reduction framework, the NEM is set to exceed a 26% reduction on 2005 level emissions by 2030 under even their most pessimistic scenarios. Admittedly, this says more about the lack of ambition tied to Australia's Paris targets than it does about aggressive decarbonization within the NEM, as the energy sector is both disproportionately responsible for emissions and disproportionately capable of reducing them. The rapid uptake of distributed energy and particularly rooftop solar mean that Australia is tracking towards 50% renewables by 2030, 
even without any new federal energy policies. While the precipitous growth of renewable energy in spite of the Australian government's interventions to prop up fossil fuels is welcome news, it is worth keeping in mind that renewables, unless they displace fossil fuels, do not directly reduce emissions. As such, the major factor dictating the speed of the energy transition in Australia is not so much the rate at which renewables are deployed, but the rate at which coal and gas exit the system. Moreover, it's easier to plan and implement a transition that only demands that we replace fossil fuels with renewables than one that involves reshaping the social relations that underpin the energy system itself. The usual detraction to community energy, or for that matter, any energy development pathway that begins rather than ends with swapping out fossil fuels for renewables, is that given the urgency and scale of the challenge, there is no time for partial conflicts and discussions which divide the forces that should actually be united in this one overarching struggle against greenhouse gas emissions. In essence, any objective that is peripheral to emissions reductions is at best dispensable or at worst a distraction. Community energy can offer a rejoinder to this claim by drawing attention to the simultaneous opportunities to build greater resilience, robust local economies, and more equitable access to energy. While the continued deployment of renewables seems inevitable, how renewables are deployed is not. Without any significant interventions targeted towards fostering community energy, the sector is unlikely to have a meaningful impact on Australia's emissions footprint. This, however, does not mean that community energy can't or won't have an impact on accelerating the transition to renewables by brokering partnerships with energy retailers and developers or setting benchmarks for commercial actors in order to earn social license to operate. These aims are laudable and worthwhile, and I fully support the community energy groups working to achieve them. That said, I feel this framing both depoliticizes community energy and detracts from its potential to transform existing relations of energy production. Community energy holds the promise of reversing the literal and figurative control over power held by a small group of actors. Reducing the concept to a means of expediting the deployment of renewable energy threatens to sacrifice this promise when it need not be lost. While a rapid transition to renewable energy without a community energy component is possible, such a transition does little to tackle the root causes of the ecological crisis. My concern here is that attempts to integrate community energy into the existing institutional and economic framework, predominantly as a tool to reduce emissions, will transform a matter of environmental antagonism into a motor force of economic development that while providing some benefits to communities, further entrenches the power of the incumbent energy regime. The need for community energy does not end with 100% renewables. Rather, its import lies in ensuring that the transition occurs in ways that resist the dominant fossil fuel agenda, reclaim social and public control over the energy system, and restructure the sector to better support democratic processes, environmental sustainability, and social justice and inclusion. This means reconceptualizing energy as a public good or commons resource rather than as a commodity. It means aggressively promoting energy conservation and the protection of functioning ecosystems. It means working to keep financial resources within communities by establishing clear links between local, local energy generation and local use. It means reversing privatization and corporate control. It means protecting workers' rights and generating secure and meaningful work. It means building shared ownership and community-based resources rather than facilitating the private accumulation of wealth. It means shifting control over all stages of the energy sector from production to distribution and extending to infrastructure, finance, technology, and knowledge. Building acceptance and support for renewable energy and accelerating a low carbon transition are part of this agenda, but the message I want to underscore is that they are just that, one part of a broader agenda. I do not mean to suggest that incorporating each of these elements into every community energy project is feasible or even desirable, and I recognize that the reality of negotiating these demands is often complex and messy given the very real constraints that community energy projects face. So the task as I see it for the community energy sector in Australia is not to lose sight of these demands and continue to build structures outside the dominant institutional and economic framework in order to support the more direct and substantial involvement of citizens in the development, ownership, and control of renewable energy resources. And I'll wrap up there by saying thank you.
Thanks so much. Yeah, maybe we can all use our reaction. Um, thank you, David. Um, um, wonderful. So where are you, Fran? Are you, you're not quite on my screen, but are you able to share your screen? Thank you. Awesome. Can you hear me well? Um, hello, everyone from Germany. It's uh, quite early at my end, but um, yeah, it's great to see so many faces and um, such a great interest in, um, in, in community energy. Um, I've been working um, actually in Australia for the last 10 years, uh, but the global situation with the pandemic um, basically made me, made me strand in, um, in, in Germany for the time being. So um, yeah, I hope that um, there will be a soon return. But um, anyway, um, I think uh, with everyone working um, remotely um, and everything going online, um, it's actually not, yeah, not too bad, um, except for the time difference. So first of all, um, Thanks so much for the organizers to, um, and the invitation. Um, I think it's uh, very pertinent and timely to kind of bring uh, community energy again to the forefront of things. And, um, and I was asked, um, similar to obviously the others, um, what community energy is and what it can actually do or contribute to the energy transition. Um, and I'm coming probably, I'm zooming out a little bit and I'm coming more from, a, from an academic point of view to some extent. So yeah, I'd like to straight jump into it. Um, nonetheless, I wanted to obviously start with um, yeah, an approach um, that has been cited um, very often in Australia um, and um, is also, was also mentioned by Jan. Uh, which captures the uh, what community renewable energy or community energies is about. Um, so it's where a community develops, delivers, and benefits from sustainable energy projects. And it comprises supply side projects, it comprises demand side projects, but also community based approaches to selling and distributing energy. And all of them can actually be seen in Australia already. So, but kind of um, zooming out a little bit or going into kind of more the, the academic approach, um, community energy activities are actually characterized uh, by normative drivers. Um, so motivations um, for environmental and social goals um, and, um, and are characterized by collective participatory governance and ownership structures. So as Jan mentioned, um, they differentiate quite a lot from the conventional or traditional utility and, and corporate energy projects, um, which is great, but it also brings a lot of complexity and, and, and challenges. So in fact, it encompasses so it, community energy comes in many forms um, and, and comes in many sizes and it comes in many different approaches. And um, to basically kind of capture this, this complexity or to address this complexity, um, a working de definition um, is, quite, is quite difficult. And my colleagues, Jara and Nikki, they proposed instead actually um, a set of kept conceptual tools for thinking about this, this rather nuanced field of community energy. Um, and they've tried to make sense of this um, diversity of community energy approaches and explore different elements um, what makes up community energy. So the range of actors, um, the voting um, patterns, the decision-making decision uh, patterns, the distribution of the financial benefits, um, the decisions around scale of the technology and the level of engagement. And um, I just wanted to quickly touch um, on one example here. Um, 
how kind of this, this spectrum could be yeah, perceived or could be, be considered. Um, so, yeah. The defining um, basically the, the actual group who makes up the community of a given project is actually a fundamental element um, of community energy. This decision underpins crucial project activities that, such as community engagement, as well as being key to project governance and in, partially, um, in particular, sorry, um, also who participates in the decision making. And as you can see um, in the spectrum, so from, from left to right, um, it could take various forms. Um, and um, basically the spectrum sheds light on who are the actors that com comprise the desired community energy um, or the community of the community energy project. And, um, and the community of locality uh, will be laid, weighted on the left side, um, as you can see, so that only, individual, only local individuals are part of the community energy project. And the community of interest um, is on the right hand side. And both will have, as I said before, different implications for the benefits that will be delivered and distributed within the community, um, but also direct impacts, obviously, of who participates and um, who has a say. So just to kind of wrap this up in, in, in short, um, the definitions um, is still a somewhat contested field. And um, actually, every community has to define what it means for themselves, uh, what community energy should be about. And as I mentioned before, um, in Australia, there are you know, more than 100, 105 groups. Um, and each of them has basically, um, yeah, took the advantage or took the opportunity to define what community energy is. So it's, it's quite challenging. And I had this conversation with Adrian actually um, to define what, what community energy um, is about and to, to yeah, capture it. Um, in a nutshell, so that's um, that's certainly that's certainly a challenge, and this yeah spectrum um, that Nikki and Jera are proposing is also an approximation, though not always um, yeah sometimes challenging for um, using it as a as a working definition. So um, the next question um, was about uh, what community energy contribute to the energy transition. And um, firstly, um, I think it's, um, it also became clear in what Taryn and Jan were saying that community energy is, um, yeah, not so much about the technology and not so much about um, the money. Um, obviously, you have to consider those elements and, and they are um, important, but um, the important piece is um, the community in this in this equation? So, what what is also obvious and um, and and probably I don't um, I don't tell you any kind of new, tr new truths here is that um, the scale of community energy is not necessarily um, yeah a great kind of mark um, in the energy transition, so to say. So um, in terms of the megawatts, community energy is contributing somewhat, but um, the big scale and the real push is coming from large scale um, projects. Nonetheless, I think that, um, and, and that has come, um, it has been already mentioned to some extent, is that community energy plays a, quite a significant role on many fronts, um, which are considered probably more the soft, um, the soft powers, um, uh, but they are they are very very important actually to to get the energy transition um, over the line and actually fully decarbonize um, the energy system. So I think one um, um, one of the roles 
and um, that has been um, also demonstrated in a number of, um, of studies, is that community energy helps to democratize governance, the governance of the energy systems through community ownership and participation. So it enables the opportunity for a lot of people to actually access the benefits of renewable energy. So it's not, not so much um, about solar rooftops um, of yeah, individual households. It's also that there are opportunities with, for instance, you might have heard about um, the solar gardens um, project um, initiatives and pilots that are going on right now, where there's this idea of actually giving renters and low income households the opportunity to um, yeah, to, to access renewable energy. So basically community energy enables kind of this, this broader um, population to, to, to participate. It um, plays a vital role in decentralizing the, um, and localizing the supply of energy. And it makes so that the energy system more visible and to some extent also more acceptable because everyone is then more aware of actually where the electricity comes from and um, has a certain stake um, and a certain interest in actually yeah making it work and then obviously um, it demonstrates that um, renewable energy is yeah, the renewable energy projects are possible and renewable energy is the future. So um, a lot of communities have been able to demonstrate um, actually that. So that, um, yeah, you can show that many actors can be involved um, and that renewable energy systems actually work. And lastly, um, and that's, that's, I think, is one of the biggest, um, at least from, from my perspective, one of the, the biggest assets or the biggest, um, greatest values of, of community energy. It mobilizes for change. So as mentioned, um, Australia has grown from a handful of projects in, in, in 2010, I was um, Ring, um, obviously one of the first and, and most um, iconic projects. Um, to more than a hundred groups and uh, yeah, many more projects um, across the country. So um, it has really been able to, to, to mobilize uh, communities to consider renewable energy. And um, just quickly two examples from, from, from Germany and Denmark. Um, the energy transition in Germany as well as in Denmark, they basically started with community energy. So with local people um, realizing that there is something amiss with the energy system and really keen on changing that um, in, in, in Germany and Denmark it was um, in, in Germany it was uh, um, the energy supply by, by, by nuclear power which didn't sit well with the people especially after the Chernobyl disaster and in Denmark and um, they haven't even had introduced nuclear power and uh, they were looking for alternatives. And so local communities and local entrepreneurs actually um, mobilized communities to consider those kind of different um, approaches um, for, for energy generation. And they were successful. They were successful um, in the way that um, Germany then adapted or adopted um, um, laws that um, actually made it possible that even more communities benefited from um, from renewable energy, and so did Denmark. So I think it's it's a great way um, to to show that community energy has a very very important role in the energy transition, even if it's not about megawatts um, or um, yeah. A significant uh, contribution to emissions reduction but without community energy i don't think that we will be able to yeah, to do the energy transition and to do what's necessary and ensure that everyone 
is actually um, yeah, aligned and accepts and also benefits from um, this huge transformation, societal transformation that is basically going on. And, um, and um, this is the last slide and, and basically wraps up the, the benefits and drivers of community energy. Um, I won't read it out, but I think the, the importance um, is again to, to see that uh, the sweet spot um, of community energy is where um, the social elements meet the political, the environmental, the technology and the economic um, dimensions. So um, yeah, I leave it with that and um, thank you so much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Fran, and maybe we can all sort of have a virtual round of applause for the three um, wonderful, wonderful speakers. Um, to me, really sort of um, crystallising um, the range of kind of political, social, cultural ways that community energy can, can have a bigger impact than, than just the footprint of the individual project. Um, so um, really wonderful complimentary talks. Thank you so much. Um, so we've actually made really great time. We've got sort of 10, 15 minutes for, um, for a Q&A session. Um, just noting that Taryn has to leave for another event in 10 minutes, we might sort of um, kick off with some of the questions that were more directed towards Taryn. And I think there are a couple of questions about the VRET and about sort of community tariffs, which I think were posed early on in your presentation, Taryn, before you got there. But perhaps would you like to kind of elaborate a little bit more on those couple of um, policy mechanisms? Yeah, sure. And, and look, I, I do believe that, that uh, CCC will be sending out our submission to VRET2 on, on the e-news um, link in the coming weeks. So, so you'll also be able to access it there. And a lot of people in this group have also signed on. So we had about 27 organisations signing on to, to the, the call from the sector. Um, essentially for a parallel process uh, for community energy alongside um, the VRET, which at the moment, the mechanism to deliver the VRET is an option scheme. And it is a very competitive and very complex process. Um, and option, options have been deployed all over the world. There's multiple examples of them being deployed for uh, community energy. And there's lots and lots of learnings, particularly out of Germany, about how it hasn't been fit for purpose um, for community energy because of those characteristics. The fact that it's often highly competitive, it's all about driving down price, um, and without a robust criteria, then you can have kind of pseudo community energy projects um, being built that, that aren't, um, you know, genuine and aren't, aren't what the communities in which they're located um, want. Uh, and, and also, you know, auction schemes are, are typically uh, set around uh, the large scale. So in this case, in the Victorian um, case, it's a minimum of 10 megawatts. So what we've been calling for, um, uh, you know, in the Victorian context is a parallel process, um, which is having a, setting a carve out of the VRET that's distinctly for community energy. And for that carve out to, to be approximately 100 megawatts by 2025, and for there to be a process that's supportive for community groups to be able to bid in and to de-risk the early phases um, and then know that they will have uh, some level of income security uh, you know, for a minimum of a 15 year period. I think what's happened in the pandemic um, over the past you know, couple of months is, is just classic. You know, that the, the spot market price in Victoria is down to $30. Now, six months ago, it was forecast to not drop um, until 2022 to $70. And that was seen as, um, you know, a bit of a, a, a cliff moment for, for most of the sector. So, you know, we're, we're in a completely variable environment. Projects cannot be built um, with that level of risk. Like we're not seeing large scale projects being built. They're, they're being de-risked through the auction scheme. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're really calling for that gap to be filled um, in regards to mid-scale projects. We're seeing a lot of support in Victoria for residential PV as well. There's lots of subsidies for that. So there's the residential market is covered and then the large scale market is covered and there's this very clear gap in the middle, which, um, you know, we, that, that's where all the projects that are, that are being developed are all, are all within that one to 10 megawatt scale and they all need a long-term incentive. Thank you, Taryn, that was really comprehensive. Um, 
There was also um, a number of questions, which I think is really um, getting to the heart of some of the potential for community energy um, shaking up the system, which was around um, sort of the capacity of the community energy sector to challenge some of the rules and regulations that make it difficult to roll out um, microgrids, um, VPPs, um, those sorts of um, technological and um, innovations. Um, and it kind of associated with that a question about um, your thoughts on the role of for-profit aggregators um, in, in those kinds of um, those kinds of schemes. So I might just open that up to the three of you. Um, Taryn, if you want to jump in first, because I know you have to go. Um, sure. Um, I mean, my, my personal perspective is that we need all the help that we can get. And if there are aggregators and other groups that want to play in the sandpit with us, then that's amazing. Um, and, you know, I think whatever agreements are signed need to be very, very clear so that the values and the level of control and governance is fit for purpose for your own local community. But yes, you know, I think the more groups and types of, um, you know, businesses that, that want to play in the sandpit with us, that, that that is a very overall positive um, thing that can happen. Um, but yeah, it's just about making sure that the you know, the, 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 rea the reality and the long-term kind of implementation of that is, is, is suitable. Fran and Jan, do you want to jump in? Jan, do you want to go first or shall I? You go ahead, Fran. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, totally what Taryn was saying. So I agree fully, we need all the help we can get. Um, and I think um, I mentioned before, and Taryn alluded to it, in, in saying that actually um, countries which started with community energy um, are now basically tracking back um, to kind of replicate the old system. Um, and so it's, it's really, really important that um, there is a constant kind of push towards community energy and integrating um, community um, interests and, and um, ideas and um, wants into the system. Because, um, yeah, what we, what we see in, in, in Germany um, is that uh, with the auction scheme, um, the numbers of people opposed to community energy, or not community energy, sorry, to renewable energy has gone up significantly. So in the last 10 years, last five to 10 years, um, the, the opposition is growing towards renewable energy. It, it also has to do obviously with more and more renewable and wind turbines and, and renewable energy projects that have been built. But um, the approach to kind of integrate communities on the ground has been withering to some extent. Um, and community energy groups find it much more harder to set up their own projects. So it's, it's really important that, um, yeah, many, many actors, many different groups, um, um, businesses, local governments, um, and, um, and other community um, uh, organizations actually um, see this opportunity um, of, um, of, yeah, taking on um, energy um, generation or even um, energy efficiency projects um, and like one, one last word here is um, saying in the lights of the, the last, last summer in Australia and this um, the devastating bushfires, um, it's, um, it's also a matter of resilience and it's a matter of adaptation um, to adopt community energy. So um, there are a lot of actually you know, a lot of um, reasons. To, to think about um, those kinds of projects, but uh, keep pushing to change the institutional environment, which still is, is a big barrier. Um, yeah, I think I, I broadly agree with what Tarrant and, and Fran mentioned earlier. Um, that said, I am a little bit more reserved about the, the framing of we need all of the help that we can get. Um, 
I also don't mean to, to demonize all of the larger energy retailers and um, in cases where they seem to be the only partner, um, I do not begrudge any community energy groups for um, partnering with a major retailer because ultimately a community energy project, even as imperfect as it might be, um, is still, I think, better than um, a renewable energy project that has no community element to it whatsoever. Um, that said, thinking about how we sort of get some of those changes or what the alternatives are um, to working with those sort of um, for-profit businesses or, or aggregators, um, I, I ultimately see it through the lens of politics and that community energy does have to have this political element to it. So, um, you know, the, the fact that community energy already has some, some standing in Australia with organizations like the Coalition for Community Energy, the Community Power Agency, um, and now a couple of, you know, community energy retailers also popping up. Um, there, there is um, a bit of a voice there and some sort of um, best practices or minimum standards emerging there. Um, and I think getting that enshrined or setting a sort of minimum level that um, retailers or for-profit businesses that are interested in partnering or getting involved um, in the sector um, need to adhere to. And I think that would, that would go um, quite a long way because there's obviously um, a massive, there's always going to be a massive power imbalance um, between the, the major energy retailers that might be interested in setting up community energy um, as opposed, and even the smaller ones, as opposed to the actual um, communities themselves that are having to uh, negotiate some of these terms. Um, so ultimately it needs to be, the, the short answer is that it needs to be um, a, a movement thing. I think that collectively we need to push for these changes and the way that I see those changes happening is through um, policy. Thank you, Jan and Fran. Um, Taryn, I know you need to jump away. Did you have anything um, to add um, on this question about um, developing country context? I'm not sure if you've had any experience or exposure or um, before you head off. I think that's one of the last questions. Um, yeah, I, before I worked at Hepburn Wind, I did I, I worked in international development. So I worked in um, East Timor, Mexico and Guatemala for about eight years. Uh, and, you know, for, for countries um, like that, for countries throughout Africa, it, it really is about often about electrification. Um, and so, you know, there is a really good opportunity for decentralised, um, you know, particularly now mini grids in particular to, to go into these environments. Um, I think that the key issue has always been around monitoring and and remote kind of operations and maintenance issues. But now there's also a lot of you know 3G technology that can go in that can be um, scanning the you know the solar panels to work out how dusty they are and things like that. So I think um, you know it, it, it is decentralized is a no brainer in regards to electrification um, in places where there's uh, you know no potentially no opportunity to to invest because you know th these areas are, are, are poorer then you know unique kind of um, arrangements can be made such as cheaper power provisions or you know if large-scale developments are going in then then community funds and things like that so I think there is there is relevance but it is um, it, it's a very different context Thank you. And um, thank you again from all of us um, for your wonderful contribution. So yeah, please head off if you need to, to go. So thanks, Joan. Um, so um, Jan and Fran, did you want to add anything to the question about um, how does community energy apply in the developing country context? Or the global south perhaps is uh, another term. Um, I can, can say a couple of words about that. So, um, uh, obviously, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm to some extent, um, although I'm, I'm also kind of practitioner to some extent, I'm also um, having um, an academic background. And, um, and uh, the main 
what, or what, what we can see in the last um, years that there are more and more studies coming from the developing countries on community energy. However, there is still a significant lack. So it's, there is still a sort of an imbalance um, in, in studies about um, developing countries. And um, I think the, the main issue there is that um, the complexity and the challenges um, to some extent are even greater or even bigger than, and then they are in, um, in developed countries. Um, and um, as um, yeah, Jan said, it's, um, it's, a policy, um, it's a policy dimension that needs to address that kind of community energy um, are supported on the ground. And in, in developing countries, often that, that type of policy support and intervention is, um, is missing. And um, so it's, uh, it depends, again, to some extent on um, external um, parties to support um, communities in that regard. Um, but um, yeah, what I'm, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that the, the extent of community energy is not, not similar um, if you just compare the academic papers that have been published about it. So um, it's, um, it's, it's certainly, there's certainly great opportunities, um, specifically where there is no centralized grid, but um, there's a greater need to, to, to look into it and to support local communities. Yeah, I would, um, I would echo Fran's comments there. Um, that community energy is something that is ultimately very context dependent. Um, so even talking about the, the global south or um, developing countries as a homogenous group is um, quite difficult when it comes to community energy. It really depends on um, their electrical grid and how the system works there and also what the specific needs are of the community, um, what the community wants to achieve. Those things can probably vary quite a lot between communities, but also across um, the sort of developing countries. The opportunity there that um, Fran mentioned um, is that moving to renewables can stand to, well, it can, it can move a lot faster in some ways if you don't need to um, grapple with the difficulties of uh, a centralized grid, or as we have in Australia, um, a, a massive uh, legacy infrastructure of fossil fuels. Um, so being able to, to sidestep that can, can provide a great advantage. And I think it's something that needs to be um, supported in those contexts, but again, um, context specific. So without, um, without having reference to an exact um, country or community, it's difficult to say anything definitive about what it should look like or what it should be or what it should mean, because that I think is for, for those, those communities and those places to decide. Thanks, Jan. And look, we just have one, um, probably space for one quick question, which is one that's been put to Fran directly about this question of um, uptake of using local renewable energy and the relationship with local manufacturing and processing of, um, of other kinds of commodities. So it's something that we know has been talked about, you know, on a large, large scale in terms of green steel, green aluminium, but um, any thoughts on or kind of knowledge about how this is applied at, at the if this has been applied at all at the community scale? I must admit, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of any projects um, that, um, yeah, that address that um, in the, the community energy space. Um, there's one, one thought that comes to mind here is that um, the more, um, the more kind of organizations that are involved, um, the complexer it gets and the more challenging it gets. And um, involving community um, in certain project, uh, projects is, is often or comes with certain transaction costs for corporates. And so um, there is some, to some extent, um, yeah, a reluctance, uh, I guess, um, to, to engage the local or to, to have the local community participating. Um, nonetheless, I think it's, um, it's an interesting idea and I think it's a, and it, it should be it should be further explored and um, and um, suggestions or ideas and proposals should be put forward. 
Um, but I must admit, I'm, I'm not aware of any projects like that having come to, to the surface yet. Thanks, Fran. Um, actually, in, in um, my own research, we had a very small scale example of that um, with a fellow who, who made um, shortbread to, to sell for fundraising. And um, he very proudly displayed that the, the shortbread was being baked using solar power. So that was um, <laughs> a very small well, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. If you, if you think of small businesses, then, then that's probably a different story. So there, there's the, the, the local brewery um, or local brewery in Sydney, uh, we, which collaborated oh, yeah. with Gala. Um, and then there is um, Clear Sky Solar, who also collaborated uh, with... Um, with another brewery, um, I think Four Pines. So there are examples of small, but I was thinking it's large scale um, next. Yeah, sorry, I put aluminium in your head. So that was probably- Yes, correct. <laughs> that's, that's right. Commodity. But, um, but there, there are small businesses who we, yeah, who come collaborate and, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah really Planning important to note those. Um, thanks, Fran, sorry. Um, so look, we've now got, and if you, I mean, there's been a few people dropping off, but there's still a few of us here, which is wonderful. So I'm going to attempt the breakout room function within Zoom. So I'll allocate, it sort of automatically allocate. I'm going to try.